Since 1977, there had been a gradual decline in the fortunes of the Denver Broncos. As the Broncos approached the playing fields of the NFL in 1981, they searched for a new direction. And they found that direction, the light that led them out of the tunnel. New owner Edgar F. Kaiser Jr. hired Dan Reeves from Dallas as head coach. Reeves arrived with a new playbook full of ideas, but with the same people to run them. But he knew that they were the right people. You win with people. And we have 45 outstanding people on this football team. If, if we didn't, I couldn't have done some of the things that I've done here. The character of this football team, and that's important. No matter where you're coaching and what you're doing, you have to have good people with strong character. And we've got that on this football team. And as long as we have those kind of people, I think we'll be successful. Reeves' new offense regenerated Broncos' enthusiasm. He chose a 38-year-old quarterback to lead his forces. And Craig Morton responded with his finest season ever. A frequent target for the quarterbacks was Steve Watson, an unheralded wide receiver who caught more touchdown passes than any Bronco in history. Reeves used in-house talent to improve the balanced Denver running attack and gave the Broncos something they've lacked, ball control. And the defense that had slumped in 1980 came back to near championship form. Indeed, the Broncos finished higher than anyone expected and were contenders for the AFC Western Division title throughout the entire season. The Broncos' 10-6 record did not surprise Dan Reeves. He established realistic goals for 1981, and the Broncos measured up. Edgar Kaiser, who assumed ownership of the Broncos in February of 81, works closely with his head coach. Kaiser's decision to hire Reeves and general manager Grady Alderman was met with criticism at first, then praise. Behind Edgar Kaiser's strong leadership and the brilliant coaching of Dan Reeves, 1981 became a revival year for the Denver Broncos. Opening day, 1981. Mile High Stadium records its 81st consecutive sellout game. But there were no grand expectations for this Denver team since the offense had been dormant during training camp. The Broncos scored just eight touchdowns in four preseason games, and Dan Reeves' offensive system was to be tested in week one by the defending world champion Oakland Raiders. The offense showed signs of life behind the receiving and running of number 46, Dave Preston. And the Broncos rolled up 358 yards of offense. But they failed to translate that yardage into points. It was a day when Denver mistakes limited their scoring and nullified an excellent punt return by Wade Manning, number 83. Manning's 52-yard run back was negated by an illegal block. On the positive side, the Broncos' defense limited Oakland to a single touchdown, and a Rick Upchurch touchdown beat the Raiders 9-7. It was a tentative beginning, but a winning one. Following a 13-10 loss in Seattle, the Broncos had scored just 19 points in two games. Yet Dan Reeves refused to replace quarterback Craig Morton. I always had a great deal of confidence that Craig could do the job if somebody really, you know, put the confidence in him and said, hey, here's the job, it's yours, and, you know, see what you can do. But I don't think he ever had that. So to me, it wasn't a tough decision at all. And from watching Craig throw the ball uh, from the first day when we brought the quarterbacks in here, Craig threw the ball extremely well. And I knew that, that Craig could do the job because he has a great experience. And that's one thing you can't replace. You know, and a quarterback. You either have experience or you don't. And uh, I wanted a guy that had the experience and could still do the job and, and Craig fit the bill. Despite three interceptions in the first quarter against Baltimore, Reeves stuck with Morton. Number seven was his man, and his patience paid off. Morton came back to throw for three more touchdowns, and the Broncos had their second win of the young season. Morton setting up as a block, throwing it for Watson. Fingertip touchdown catch! Steve Watson gets his second touchdown reception of the day, 
And the Broncos come right back down the field. A week later, the Broncos and the city of Denver prepared to host the undefeated San Diego Chargers. Broncos fans are a curious mixture, a cross-section of the thriving Denver community. From the casual elite to the down-home faithful, Broncos fans know no bounds of style and expression. And for the 12th straight year, every regular season game was sold out. On a Sunday afternoon in September, the Broncos stunned the Chargers in a manner befitting a first-place team. <laughs> Riley Odom's first period touchdown ignited a Broncos scoring spree that shocked even the most optimistic Bronco backers. Egloff in motion, the fake, and the quick pass, and it is caught by Watson. He breaks free at the 30, 40. Watson will go all the way. Put that one in the highlight film. Second and goal. Egloff in motion. And Morton throwing it to the back of the end zone to James Wright. Touchdown. Jim Wright has his first Bronco touchdown. Morton has thrown three touchdown passes. And we're still in the first quarter. While the offense ran up numbers like a gas pump, the Bronco defense was primed to short circuit San Diego's record breaking passing attack. And Fouts takes the straight drop back on first down, throwing it long up the far side for Joyner, and it is tipped in the air. Foley with the interception at the five. Foley added two more interceptions before the day was done. While the Denver secondary confined Air Coriel to the landing strip, Craig Morton and the rejuvenated Broncos offense built a 35 to nothing lead. The pressure, he steps up in the pocket, he throws it to Watson, touchdown! Steve Watson, all by himself! For Craig Morton, 17 completions in 18 attempts for 308 yards and four touchdowns. Simply the best single game effort by any NFL quarterback in 1981. The ascent of the Denver Broncos to first place in the AFC Western Division paralleled the achievements of a rising star who wore number 81. He was not drafted after his college career. He signed as a free agent, then spent two seasons taking his lumps on the special teams. He was so deep on the Denver death chart that he never got his picture on a bubblegum card. He has one now. In his first two seasons with the Broncos, Steve Watson caught just 12 passes. Now he holds the Broncos' season record for touchdowns with 13. An unknown quantity until this year, Watson became an overnight sensation after three seasons. Watson caught 60 passes in 1981 for 1,244 yards, averaged over 20 yards per reception, and was selected by his peers as a starting wide receiver for the AFC in the Pro Bowl. Steve Watson, from also ran to all pro. While Watson stands on the threshold of a brilliant career, another Bronco receiver is saying goodbye to one. For 14 seasons, 10 with the Broncos, Haven Moses has been a fixed star. Coaxed out of retirement a year ago by Dan Reeves, Moses came back for a final season and lent his experience to younger Bronco receivers. 
A vibrant performer, Moses was a major contributor on three Denver playoff teams. On the receiving end of 56 career touchdown passes, Moses personified the pride of Bronco football. While players may come and go, one unit remains constant in the high country, the Denver defense. In their second meeting with Oakland, Bronco defenders limited the Raiders to 168 total yards, intercepted two passes, forced seven fumbles, and allowed zero points. The shutout prompted rival runners to wonder, who are those guys? They are virtually the same group as last year. But given some deep breathing room as the offense became more ball control oriented, the defense played with its old ferocity. Historically, success for the Denver Broncos has revolved around an integrated defensive effort, a team concept strength in numbers. Individuals allowing other individuals to play their best. When nose tackle Reuben Carter, number 68, tied up blockers in the middle, he allowed defensive end Rulon Jones, number 75, to fulfill the promise of his rookie season. Jones made everyone's all-rookie team a year ago, and for the second straight season was far and away the Broncos' leader in quarterback sacks. Jones' counterpart on the other side is Barney Chavis, number 79, the senior member of the Denver front line, who has not missed a starting assignment in four years. Backed up by Bryson Manor, Don Latimer, and Greg Boyd, they are an aggressive mixture of youth and experience. Behind the big men up front are Bob Swenson, back at strong side linebacker, and Randy Gratishar, fully healthy for the first time in three seasons. The result was predictable. Gratishar led the team in tackles for the seventh straight season. Number 51, Bob Swenson, was sidelined with a broken arm last year, then came back to join Gratishar as Bronco representatives in the Pro Bowl. Swenson's all-pro credentials were complemented by outside linebacker Tom Jackson, number 57. The nine-year veteran led all linebackers in sacks and was the team's second leading tackler and was selected most inspirational player by his teammates. Jackson's enthusiasm mixed well with the other starter, Larry Evans, number 56, and with reserves Jim Ryan, Mark Merrill, and rookie Steve Busick. While the linebackers went injury-free, the secondary was not so fortunate. Rookie Dennis Smith took over for injured All-Pro Lewis Wright, then trained under veterans Steve Foley, Billy Thompson, and Aaron Kyle, and helped create the second-best pass defense in the AFC. Mike Harden and Kerry Smith played important roles, while Steve Trimble and Roland Solomon were added late in the season. But top billing went to Billy Thompson, number 36. In his 13th season as a Bronco, Thompson was elected to the Pro Bowl for the third time. By the season's ninth week, the Denver defensive unit ranked number one in the NFL. The Broncos looked to break a two-game losing streak in a Monday night meeting at Mile High Stadium with the Minnesota Vikings. A win would put the Broncos at 6-3 and, and move them into a three-way tie for first place in their division. Again, it was defense that shut down Minnesota and neutralized the best passing game in the NFC.
Tight end Ron Egloff's clutch pass receptions and the running of Tony Reed and Rob Lytle and another Craig Morton scoring strike to Steve Watson earned the Broncos a 19-17 win. The Broncos were back in a first place tie and every element of the team contributed to the rise to the top. The kicking game featured punter Luke Prestridge who led all AFC punters in 1980 and Fred Steinford who won the Golden Toe Award a year earlier. But it took an overtime game with Cleveland to bring Fred back to his 1980 form. Foley and Thompson at the safeties. And Seip back to pass into the far side for Calvin Hill at the Bronco 48 and he fumbles the ball. Who's got it? Denver. Denver ball. Dennis Smith's defensive game breaker got the Broncos possession at midfield. The overtime plan, one big play, get the ball into field goal range and take over sole possession of first place. up the far side, up church is open at the 25, up church at the 20 to about the 17 yard line. And here comes Steinford. 2020 tie, sudden death overtime, snap, ball down, Steinford's kick, good, game's over. Broncos 23, Browns 20. This one is over and Steinford has won it. Close to the entire organization in his first year as owner, Edgar Kaiser brought a personal style to the Broncos, and with it, new energy and leadership that built a winning organization. When Craig Morton sustained a sprained shoulder against Tampa Bay, the quarterbacking duties were handed over to Steve DeBerg, number 17. DeBerg was backed up by rookie Mark Herman, the Broncos' young fourth-round draft choice. DeBerg directed two second-half scoring drives, one of which ended in a touchdown pass to Larry Canada, and the Broncos won their third straight 24-7. The win was a credit to the people who enabled the Broncos to set a team record for total offensive yards, the offensive line. Led by offensive captain Claudie Miner, the unit is built around center Billy Bryan, number 64. Guards Tom Glassick, Glenn Hyde, and Paul Howard join tackles Kelvin Clark, Ken Lanier, and Dave Stutter to lead a coordinated charge that begins at the line of scrimmage and continues 15 yards downfield. These are the men who open lanes for a balanced group of Bronco runners. The brightest light of the Denver running attack shown on Rick Paris, number 24. Drafted two years ago, Paris suffered a knee injury in training camp and spent the 1980 season on injured reserve. Fully recovered for his first year of play, Paris led all Bronco runners with 749 yards. The total yard title among runners belonged to Dave Preston, number 46. Running and receiving, Preston accounted for 1,147 yards, almost doubling his output of last season. Preston and Paris powered the Broncos' running game into December. But after two road losses, the Broncos came home with their work cut out. By winning each of their three remaining games, they would be assured of the AFC West title. Victim number one, the Kansas City Chiefs. Ahead by three points, Denver defenders spent the final quarter turning back one Kansas City drive after another. With the Chiefs threatening at the Bronco 22-yard line with less than two minutes remaining, Bob Swenson turned in the key play of the game. Chiefs ball at the Bronco 22-yard line. It's third down and two. Fuller dropping back, looks to his right, throws. Intercepted. Swenson at the 20 yard line. Coming to the near side. Swenson at the 25, at the 30. He's at the 35, the 40, the 45, the 48 yard line. And the Broncos take over.
The 16-13 win provided the momentum for a 23-13 win the next week over the Seahawks. Two down, one to go. A win in Chicago would bring a division championship back to Denver. But the chase ended at Soldier Field. Two touchdowns by Rick Upchurch from Steve DeBerg could not overcome mistakes that led to Chicago scores. And the Broncos fell 12 points short of a title. But the fact that the Broncos came as far as they did made it a season to remember. And no one man reflected the struggle and accomplishment and ups and downs of 1981 more than Craig Morton, a man most thought too old to play the game, let alone play it well. I love this game because I love the, the challenge it presents each Sunday when I go out there. You know, I'm just real fortunate to have played this game, and it took me a long time to become serious about playing. But it shouldn't be that way. I think that we owe a lot to a lot of other people. And when you're playing on that field and you're the quarterback, and if you don't have those guys up front having confidence in you and want to play for you, it's going to be a long afternoon, a long season, a long career. I've been fortunate since I've been playing football, and in particular here, these guys have always had a lot of confidence in me and you know, really helped me out greatly. And you don't do it by yourself. Whatever success we have is because of 45 guys that really want to play and have confidence in their leaders. Among fallen angels and rising stars, Craig Morton has taken a roller coaster ride through the NFL. Battling aches and age, he rode another crest in 1981, and the Denver Broncos rode with him. One of the NFL's premier quarterbacks, Morton embodied the spirit of the Denver community and its team. Indeed, it was a revival year in the high country, and in the most competitive season in NFL history, the Denver Broncos regained their place among the winners.